My religious wife crossed the only line I set for her, so I'm considering breaking up. My wife and I have known each other for 10 years and got married in 2018. We have very different lifestyles, she's a very devout Christian and I am not religious. We found some way to make it work, it was a hard road, but we love each other very much. She has never met my biological mother because I cut her from my life. My parents were divorced long before I met her, and I broke contact with my mom after I turned 18. My mom was extremely abusive towards me growing up. She physically abused me and my sister regularly and tried to frame it on my father. She was able to manipulate a doctor to give me multiple medications growing up and she'd steal the meds. Her dirt boyfriend also tried to be abusive too. I cut my losses and cut all contact with my mother and her family just like my sister. My dad didn't approve of my wife at first because of her religion, but they get along now. When my wife asked me when she'd be able to meet my mom, I told her she never would, she's a violent and terrible woman and she has no place in my life and I didn't want her involved in ours. I made sure to explicitly tell her to not contact anyone in my mom's family. Recently, my mom showed up at my work, which she did not know of. It got ugly, and police had to be called to remove her property. She came in trying to throw things at me because I cut her out and would call me things I never wish to hear again. She called me a terrible son for not taking care of her when she needed money for groceries. I didn't want to create a scene so I took all of her anger and waited for the police's arrival. It was such an embarrassment. When I got home, I told my wife, and she just had her, oh poop look on her face. I asked what that was about and she confessed she reached out to my mom and told her where I worked because my mom told her that she wanted to make amends. My wife believes that everyone deserves forgiveness and doesn't believe something could be unforgivable. I told her that violated the one thing I told her was out of bounds and didn't even tell me until it went wrong. She of course has been apologetic, I told her we'd get there, but I needed to get through it. I've been sleeping in the office at home, and we've barely spoken since. We were supposed to travel to her parents for Thanksgiving, but I considered staying home with the dog so I could sort myself out. While she was gone I took the time to think and figured that if she could neglect my opinion regarding this, then very likely she could do the same. When she got home I told her how I felt and how I'm considering breaking up. My entitled husband allowed his best man to propose on our wedding day even though I said no. Now he's regretting everything because I want a divorce. Me and my husband have been planning this wedding for over a year. We were agreeing on everything except when the matter of the guest list came up. Now, I knew that my boyfriend was going to make his friend, Jacob, as his best man. Jacob can be a little self-centered at times. When we go out with friends, he would always order the most expensive meal and then later argue that we split the bill evenly because that was just less work. He often makes and cancels plans as he wishes, even though it can mess up my entire schedule. This one time, I was planning on going on a lovely dinner date with my boyfriend. But Jacob showed up at our house unannounced with drinks, and said that he wanted to spend some time with his best friend. I tried telling him that we aren't free today, but my boyfriend insisted that we have our date next week since Jacob was already here. That being said, I supported my boyfriend's decision of making him the best man, because it was his choice and not mine. I thought that I could tolerate him for one day for my future husband's sake, but I was wrong. A few months ago, my boyfriend randomly said that Jacob wanted to pose at our wedding reception. I firmly rejected that idea, because that day was meant for us and not him. Of course, I would be very happy to help him in his proposal, but doing it on our wedding day was just stealing the attention from the newly married couple. I had heard other stories of people doing this, and absolutely despised the idea. My boyfriend agreed with me and told Jacob that he can propose on a later date, or so I thought. Leading up to the wedding, I was asked multiple times whether he could do his proposal during our reception. Jacob argued that it would be the only day where they would both be dressed formally for the pictures, and he wanted a good memory. Every single time I had to shut it down by saying that that day was special to us, and I didn't want to have it ruined. I was surprised that they were so insistent, especially my boyfriend. I wanted my special day to be perfect, and explained that to my boyfriend for the fourth time one month before the wedding. That was the last day we talked about this, and I thought they had finally given up on the idea. On the day of the wedding, I noticed my now husband and Jacob talking in secret a few times, but I ignored it thinking it was nothing. Everything, including the ceremony, went amazingly up until the reception. We were sitting, watching a slideshow of our beautiful memories and were about to do our couple's dance, when Jacob suddenly snatched the mic and instructed everyone to be quiet. He had already performed his best man speech before this, so everyone was surprised. I hoped that he wasn't going to do what I think he was, because I had already rejected the idea. I looked towards my husband, hoping he would stop his friend, but to my surprise he had run off and come back holding something. He was holding flowers and a placard that had the words will you marry me on it. As Jacob's girlfriend walked in the middle, my biggest fear came true and I ran off because I just couldn't take it anymore. I shut myself in my room and began crying my eyes out. When my husband walked in the room, he began yelling at me, telling me to grow up. He accused me of ruining the special moment because I was an attention seeker and couldn't stand others being happy. It wasn't the proposal that angered me so much, but the fact that my own husband had completely disregarded my wishes. I had told him multiple times that I didn't want this, and yet he allowed this to happen anyway. I decided that I didn't want to spend the rest of my life with someone who doesn't care about my opinion. I told him to get out and spent the night alone. The next day, I avoided everyone and went home with my parents, and began calling a divorce lawyer. 
My husband tried calling me, but he was saying the same thing, that I was acting childish and needed to just get over it. When I sent him the divorce papers though, he realized that I am serious and quickly changed his tone. He began apologizing for going against my wishes, and said he would never do that again. But the doubt had already made its way into my mind. I was no longer sure if I could spend the rest of my life with him, and by extension, Jacob. I told him that he needs to set his priorities. Because if even on his wedding day, he is prioritizing his friend over his wife, then I can't marry him. Jacob hasn't commented on the situation, except of course calling me sensitive and childish, so I am staying firm on my decision to divorce my husband. My narcissistic husband thought that I slept with his gay friend and demanded a paternity test, so I divorced him and left him miserable. I have been married to my husband for five years and we just had our second child. Our first child was a son with blonde hair and freckled skin, a splitting image of my husband. I have naturally red hair by the way, and my husband loves my hair. But for some reason he was glad that our son wasn't a redhead. He was very proud and bragged a lot about how his genes were superior than mine and that's why our son looked so much like him. In fact, the only time he stopped talking about it was when I got pregnant again. Throughout the nine months, he kept telling everyone that our second child was also going to be a blonde and there was no way to prevent this. I thought this was weird but funny, and went along with him by saying yeah, I also think the baby will have blonde hair. He was really excited because this time we were having a daughter instead of a son. However, his tone completely changed once I gave birth. Our daughter was the opposite of our son, and a complete splitting image of me. She had beautiful red hair and I was so happy for her because she was going to become the most beautiful girl in the world. But my husband showed a concerning lack of happiness. Even before we left the hospital, he kept commenting that the red hair on our daughter was just temporary. And that his genes were just taking their time but would eventually prevail, she would also end up having blonde hair. Again, I didn't get why he was saying all this, but I didn't pay much attention to it. It did bother me that he would avoid holding her, or taking care of her, but I convinced myself that it was nothing. A few weeks later, we held a baby shower for our daughter and my husband invited his gay friend. I surprisingly got along with him since we had a lot in common, and we talked a lot during the party. He also had red hair, but it was obvious that he had dyed it from black, while me and my daughter were natural. He was constantly complimenting how my daughter had the best colored hair and I was really happy. But my husband would sometimes interrupt us, and once again exclaim that the red hair was only temporary. I ended up asking him why he was so adamant on this topic. He explained that since our son had blonde hair, it meant that all our children should be the same because that's how genes work. I tried to explain to him that that wasn't the case at all, but he didn't listen. Anyway, a few days passed and I thought that my husband had finally dropped the topic. But out of nowhere, he came up to me and began demanding a paternity test. That really shocked me because he had never said anything about this before and with our first child. He was essentially accusing me of cheating on him, something that I would never do. I said that I loved him, so why was he asking for such a thing? He refused to explain and just said that he wanted to be sure. I asked, be sure of what? And kept pressing him to tell me why he was being so suspicious. Being accused of cheating was actually very painful for me, and I wanted to know how he came to that conclusion. After a bit more pressing, he finally cracked and blew up on me while telling me the reason. I saw how you kept talking to my friend at the party. You never talked that much with another guy, so it was obvious what was going on. I knew that my genes would never lose to yours. So the only reason that your second child has red hair is because she isn't my daughter. You probably slept with him and kept it hidden from me. He also has red hair, so it explains everything. His reasoning was absolutely ridiculous, and I reminded him that his friend was gay and already married to another man. Also, he had dyed his hair and his natural hair color was black. I asked him why he couldn't just accept that our daughter looked like me, and her hair color wasn't an unnatural phenomenon that needed to be explained. But he kept telling me to shut up, and that he was getting a paternity test no matter what. The weirdest part was that he wanted a paternity test between our daughter and his friend, instead of our daughter and him. By that point, I had already broken into tears because he was refusing to believe me no matter what. He said that he was leaving, and wouldn't come back home until I had gotten that test done and proved that he was right, and that I had cheated on him. The moment he left, I hugged my daughter and son close to my chest, and cried for a good hour. Then I called my sister to come pick me up because I was leaving. I packed all my clothes and took my kids with me. I just texted my husband that we were over, and that I was going to divorce him. It turns out, he wasn't expecting me to fight back and thought that I would do exactly as he said. He quickly began apologizing for doubting me, and urged me to come back home with the kids. He sent me selfies to prove that he hadn't stopped crying, and was miserable without me. Apparently, he had also accused his gay friend of infidelity, and gotten punched by his husband. The news of his accusations had spread and his entire friend group had cut him off, so he was completely alone now. He said that me and the kids were all he had. But while he was typing, he messed up and ended up saying that his suspicions were 100% justified. So I just blocked him after saying, kids? I thought you said you only have one kid. But don't worry, they will be taken care of by someone who loves them for who they are, 
and not just their hair color. I organized all the students against my political science professor. I was a non-traditional student so I was a little older and a little more willing to question things. I was taking a 3000 level political science course so it designed was for poli-sci majors and was required for my poli-sci degree. It was a fairly basic political science course but the professor did some weird things. Specifically, there was a quiz every class over the assigned reading. These quizzes made up a significant part of the grade. But here's the tricky part, he seemed to be doing some sort of experiment with the wisdom of crowds. The correct answer for a quiz question was the answer that was given by the most students in the class, whether it was based in fact or not. Whatever the most students said was the answer was the correct answer. For example, if the question was what year was the US Constitution ratified? Even though the factually correct answer would be 1789, if the majority of people chose 1776, then 1776 was the right answer and you got credit for your answer. If you chose 1789, you were wrong and didn't get credit. This forced you to make a decision, try to be factually accurate or try to figure out what the crowd was going to do and go with that. Neither guaranteed you a correct answer. The majority of the time, the majority of students would actually choose the factually correct answer. But if it was a common misconception, or the question was poorly worded, then that could lead to a situation where the crowd was wrong. But here's the thing that drove me nuts. 1. I was not willing to make my grade dependent on whatever the other students thought might be the correct answer. 2. My grade became dependent on conforming to what the crowd said was true. I had no real control over my grade since the wisdom of the crowd could be anything. 3. A class of 30 students was probably not a large enough crowd to give you a good example of the wisdom of crowds. 4. Learning the material was not the point. Conforming to the crowd was what got you a good grade. I figured out that if we all agreed to choose the same answer for every question then we could all guarantee ourselves a perfect score on the quiz. In reality, I only needed a plurality of people to go along with my plan. As long as I could muster enough votes for an answer, then we could control our destiny. It didn't matter if A was the correct answer or not. If we controlled the votes, we controlled our grades. And anyone who didn't go with us, they were going to fail regardless of if their answer was actually correct or not. I met everyone at the door to the classroom and explained the plan. For every question, we are going to choose the first option. If it's multiple choice, it's option A. If it's true slash false, we are choosing true. If we all agree to this, then we can all get perfect scores. If you decide to go against us, your answer will be wrong. The first class we did this, the professor figured out after a few questions that we were gaming the system. He had us redo the quiz and graded us on the factually correct answers. After the second class we did this, the professor changed the rules. There were two answers that would get you full points, the factually correct answer, and whatever answer the majority agreed upon. In the end, I was okay with this arrangement. I could study and give the correct answer without being penalized for not conforming to the crowd's thinking, or if I made the same mistake as the majority of people then I still got credit for it and it was a good discussion point for the class. Yes, I got an A in the class. I'm not sure if the professor ever figured out who organized the rebellion. But I did end up working with him in grad school and we got along just fine. My parents threw me out as a child, and then expected everything from me when my grandparents died. My mother and father had me when I was 16 and used to lay hands on me all throughout my childhood. My father used to yell at five-year-old me and blame me for ruining his dreams and aspirations in life. I was already unloved, but when I was six my younger sister was born, and I was left completely uncared for and unwanted. We lived in a two-bedroom apartment. And as my sister got older, it went from me sharing a bedroom with her, to me kicked out of the room entirely. I slept on the couch for two years, then the couch was put into the basement, meaning I could sleep either in the basement or on the floor. When I was 10, my parents decided they were going to move away. But this move did not include me. I ended up actually being fine with this, as my grandparents had agreed to take me in. My life was instantly better. I got my own room again, and my grandparents gifted me a brand new N64 in 1996. I was finally happy. As time went on, I grew up and eventually moved out. But later moved back in to help my grandparents' house as they were getting old and living off their retirement savings. So some rent money for me went a long way in paying the bills. Then my grandma died. She was mugged by a robber, who took her life. My grandpa was heartbroken. He also passed about a year and a half later. He took his life. Pretty much everything they owned was willed to me. Their savings, their house, their vehicles, their stuff, everything. The house was long paid off, and grandpa knew how to keep up with its maintenance. In fact, after grandma died he kind of doubled down on renovating the place. He had the roof redone, the house was repainted by us inside and out, and we fixed a lot of little things. Grandpa's neighbor George even came by to help redo the plumbing. One morning I was fixing breakfast and my grandpa never came downstairs. You couldn't keep the man from his bacon. So I went. To check on him. I found him there, suspended via a rope. My parents made grandpa's funeral a crap show. They didn't bother to show up for grandma's. They were too busy. And at grandpa's funeral they didn't seem to grieve at all. My sister also showed up wearing a brightly colored designer dress. Which I wasn't happy about as it was a church clothes only function. I noticed my parents repeatedly whispering to each other and glaring at me whenever I looked at them. Come to find out at the will reading that my parents knew that they'd been disinherited long ago for their treatment of me and they thought it extremely unfair I got everything. They threatened to sue me to contest the will. And I got repeated calls and messages from my father, mother and sister telling me I needed to do the right thing and give my father what was supposed to be his. I told them all to flake off in far more unsavory words. My parents ended up taking me to court to challenge the will. But the judge ruled in my favor after seeing the will and hearing us both out. So it wasn't a long drawn out legal battle. 
The judge even looked at my parents with absolute disgust after seeing the will and hearing about their mistreatment of me in my childhood. He called my father a terrible parent, and that my grandparents were right to disown him. My father just hung his head in silence, but he made sure to stop me outside the courtroom and tell me I was always the biggest mistake of his life. And that if he could go back in time, he'd make sure I never existed. He should have been a football star. And instead he has to wear a name tag for a 9 to 5. I told him that mistake or not, grandma and grandpa could see what kind of nasty person he was. I didn't ask to be born. And the only real love I ever got was from my grandparents. And he was no father of mine anymore. I got a few more threatening and harassing phone calls, as well as some letters from my parents. All demanding money among other things. But, over time they just stopped because I completely stonewalled them. The last call I ever got from them was telling me that my sister needed a kidney transplant and if I could help them out. I actually agreed and told them to meet me at a hospital that was a two-hour drive from them. They rode out, and I never showed up. I blocked their number as soon as I got the first call that they're there. My ex's pick-me friend lied about me and now they're crawling back. I, 26, was with my ex-boyfriend, 26, for four years. We moved in after two years of dating and were genuinely happy. I genuinely thought that I was going to marry him one day. I even moved to a different country to stay with him when his job relocated him to Europe. Throughout our relationship I noticed that one of his girlfriends, 25, didn't really like me. I've tried many times to befriend her but I gave up after constantly being on the receiving end of her cold shoulder and snarky remarks. X knew about this and told me that she didn't have that many girlfriends and probably didn't know how to be friends with another woman. She's the only woman in their clique of seven guys, who are all lovely to me. On the 31st of December 2019, both of us attended a party to celebrate New Year's. I don't drink so I was completely sober. X got completely smashed. The next afternoon I woke up to my stuff packed and him telling me that we were done and that I had to move out. I was completely blindsided and so confused. He accused me of cheating on him. I would never do that. I think it's such a terrible thing to do. I remember crying so hard and telling him that I did no such thing but he still kicked me out. My best friend and her boyfriend, without hesitation, opened up their home to me and told me that I was welcome to stay. Bless their hearts. They're the sweetest couple ever. During that dark period of time, I was trying to process everything. I was honestly so depressed. I couldn't eat, couldn't sleep. I felt like a zombie, like I was barely existing. I told my family what had happened and they were very upset for me and wanted me to fly back home. They live in a different country and I didn't want to travel during a pandemic and potentially put them at risk of catching this virus. While this was happening, all of our mutual friends and his family members turned against me. Choosing to believe that I was a cheater and completely cut me off in support of my ex. They posted shady stuff about me online, calling me a hoe and a cheater. Rumors started to spread and it affected me so much that I deleted all social media and blocked all of them everywhere. I just wanted to disappear. As time went on, I was one day introduced to one of my best friend's friend. He was really sweet and kind. We slowly became friends, started chatting and video calling. Fast forward to June and I feel myself slowly falling in love with him. He doesn't believe what so many people say about me being a cheater and whatnot. He asks me out on a proper virtual date and I agree. We started dating and I'm so happy. I feel like he is the light at the end of my tunnel. Well yesterday, someone from my ex's clique leaked a video on Instagram where my ex's girlfriend was boasting of how she lied and came up with this plan to break up my ex and I. She apparently paid someone to lie to my ex and tell him that I seduced him at the New Year's party and slept with him. Once that came out a lot of my ex's friends and family members have been trying to contact me. They tried contacting my best friend who basically told them to F off. My ex came to the house and was begging for me to speak to him. It was really dramatic. I feel like I don't owe them any of my time at all and just want them to leave me alone. However, my parents think that it's a little sad that my ex is outside the house crying and begging to speak to me. They think that maybe I should give him a chance to speak to me. I feel really conflicted. I feel like I'm being too harsh on him and his group of friends. Should I establish a line of communication? What should I do? My husband called me by his dead wife's name twice. Please help. I met my husband four years ago through the same work industry and we both instantly felt the same attraction. On our first date he told me he was widowed, that his wife had died unexpectedly at the age of 31, two years prior. Three years later, we got married at the beginning of this year. Everything has been good until two months after we got married. I've noticed that his behavior was changing, he started to get more quiet and kept to himself. He stopped telling me about his day or talking to me about his niche interests like he usually does. I asked him if he was feeling all right because this behavior was really unusual. He admitted that while cleaning, he came across some of his previous wife's belongings and that he accidentally tossed something from their wedding night. I felt sad for him and I couldn't imagine how he felt as this is my first marriage. I tried my best to cheer him up but his happiness was short. One night, we got into a small disagreement about some movie we were watching. During the argument, he called me by her name which is something that he had never done. He looked frightened and shocked that he said this. He kept apologizing after it and I told him it was alright. Cried and I held him. The next morning, I noticed he didn't sleep at all. I asked him if he wanted to talk about what happened the previous night. He got mad and told me he was gonna go visit his brother. I felt worried and told him I love him just for reassurance. It did hurt that he called me by her name, but part of me wanted to understand where he was coming from. I know he really loved this woman and sometimes I don't think I can amount to her. 
It seems like he holds her to a pedestal and I'm just there. I have hoped he doesn't actually feel that way, but with the recent events, I'm starting to think about it more and more. He came home around midnight and he apologized for what happened and how reacted. I told him everything was fine and didn't express my concerns because I didn't want it to turn into another huge argument. A few weeks ago, we were having intimacy and while he was finishing, he called me by her name again. This time I was mortified, jumped off the bed, and moved away from him. He tried to comfort me by giving me a hug and he kept apologizing. I told him I was going to stay in our guest room and I did not feel up to a confrontation right now. I didn't sleep at all that night. The next morning, he kept apologizing and told him it's fine. We talked for a bit, I asked him if he was alright and if he needed to speak to someone professionally. He agreed to go speak to someone, but he didn't show up to the appointment that we had set up for him. Our conversation since then has been insanely short. Everything has been weird since he called me her name during intimacy. He rarely speaks to me, only when he needs something. Which makes me sad because I do love him, but I'm scared that he doesn't love me. Worst of all, I recently found out that I'm pregnant. I'm happy because I've always wanted to be a mother, but I am sad I don't know if the father of my child even loves me anymore. Naval officer didn't want to live with degenerate enlisted, so I got him fired. I was a Navy enlisted service member and was stationed in Yokosuka, Japan for a few years before I got transferred back stateside. I worked in the main hospital that cared for service members and their beneficiaries. It's a small hospital so everyone knows everyone. Shortly after I left, I caught wind of a new physician officer working in the radiology department. My friends would say he's horrible to work with but that's nothing new. However, someone saw him print a letter and he left it on his desk and took a picture of it and sent it to me. He's requesting to move from enlisted housing to officer. For context, military housing is available for those who are married, have a family, or are qualified based on their rank and depending on the military base itself. Typically, officer housing is much nicer than the enlisted. In Yokosuka, housing is basically the same all around because it's overseas. But most of the housing are apartments and each apartment complex is called a tower, example, Fuji Tower. There are nine towers and two are for officers since enlisted members outnumber officers by a lot. Now, one thing about the military, poop happens. When getting stationed, it is the active duty member's responsibility to either apply for housing on or off base before arriving, depending on what is allowed. If there is limited space and you don't apply for housing on time, then you get put where there is space. So our new officer got placed in an enlisted tower. Mind you, enlisted members have families of their own and other officers have been placed in enlisted housing before without an issue. Here are some quotes in his letter, I have many valid objections to living in a building of almost all enlisted and even many lower enlisted being an officer. There is a lot of crime, violent actions, substance use and alcoholism that happen in enlisted housing. There are also intimate assaults and other perverts. I have a good-looking family, a wife and two daughters aged three and four. They are prime targets to be victims for these enlisted deviant activities. My family should be safe in housing that is with officers. Officers are much more respectable and these types of deviant activities are incredibly rare compared to the deviant activities of enlisted being commonplace. Other officer families will not want to visit us because our family lives in enlisted housing. My children need to make friends with other officer children. My wife needs to make friends with other officers' wives. I need to make friends with other officers. Forcing an officer to live in a large apartment building with almost all enlisted is unethical. You get the idea, he's a piece of work. This guy basically looks down on all enlisted service members assuming every single one are substance users, pervert slash PDOS, criminals, etc. The kicker? He was an enlisted army member before going to officer school. In civilian terms, think of a manager that discriminates and calls all of his subordinates criminals, violent, alcoholics, pervs, substance users, etc. based on your job position. Forgetting that some have a family and you know, maybe aren't any of those things. And he not only has the authority to ruin your work life, he can ruin your personal life by denying days off, making you stay late, writing you up if he doesn't like you and not letting you promote, etc. Safe to say, everyone was pissed and I had nothing to lose. I was separating soon and figured I'd have some fun before I got out. I created a burner Facebook account and posted the letter and the officer's picture on a popular military enlisted group page. Within two days, it spread like wildfire. But I wasn't done yet. The military has something called challenge coins. Think of trading cards but custom coins that come in many shapes and sizes. I designed one with his face and a big middle finger in the back. On top of that I designed stickers too. Show how proud us deviants are. Other coin designs came from other people as well but so far I think mine was more popular. I sold over 70 coins to the person who originally sent me the picture at a huge discounted price so she can sell them for a profit for herself. So the officer's face is everywhere because most people keep their coins displayed on their desks. No matter where the officer went to work, he would see his face on someone's desk. And since it didn't have his name on the coin, I can't officially say it's him. I sold more stateside and even some got sent to Europe. I made about $3,000 overall which was nice. The story even got featured on the online naval newspaper and on two popular YouTube channels. And if you're military, you know the only time big military care is when it's too big to sweep under the rug. This story got the officer sent up to captain's mast which is like a navy court. He tried to say his wife was the one that wrote the letter but no one is buying it because her writing style is way worse. She even tried to take the fall but no one believed her. They both ended up deleting all social media. Due to this, he got served three UCMJ articles which basically are his offenses. But there's more. When you're in the military, you have a deadline on how long you can be a certain rank. If you don't pick up, then you're kicked out. 
and because he's new and got served UCMJ articles, he won't be up for promotion and therefore was involuntarily separated. Also the officer program he went through pays for his PhD. When the military pays for your PhD, you have to serve 10 years to pay them back, if you don't complete 10 years, you have to pay the military back with money instead of time. So he lost his job and now has to pay back the military for his PhD and since it takes a while for the paperwork to have him and his family sent back stateside, you can bet he socially suffered because no one worked with him. My entitled wife tried to embarrass me by flirting with another man and called me a mama's boy. But she regretted it instantly once I threatened to leave her on the spot. I recently took my wife on a vacation abroad because I thought it would help resolve a fight that we were having. But she decided to use the vacation as an excuse and do something unbelievable. Let me quickly tell you how ridiculous our fight was first. One year ago, her parents needed some money because they wanted to do a few repairs around their house. I agreed to send over a substantial amount because I wanted to help them, and even went over to help with the labor. My wife was really happy and thanked me a lot. I did it because I consider them my parents as well, and we are a family. A similar situation happened a month ago, where my mother needed some financial help. She is a single mom and has struggled her entire life, but never asked me for help before this. So I was really eager to finally give her a helping hand, and sent over the same amount that I had sent to my wife's parents. However, my wife didn't like this at all. She argued that I should have asked her before sending over money, and that my mom was most likely lying about needing help. I argued by saying that she had no reason to lie, and even if she was indeed lying, I still wanted to send her money. So my wife ended up calling me a mama's boy and said that I am ruining our marriage by making decisions without her opinion. I asked her that she didn't hesitate to send money over when her own parents asked for help, so how is this any different? After that, she has been ignoring me because she thinks I'm trying to gaslight her. I decided that it wasn't worth fighting over, and booked tickets for us to go to another country and cool our nerves down. I did this because I loved my wife, and wanted us to stop fighting. She was really delighted to go on this trip, and forgave me when I showed her the tickets. The hotel we were staying at had a pool and a spa, so she was really excited to experience it. Everything was going well, we landed safely and had a wonderful ride to the hotel. But as soon as we entered our room, my wife's tone changed completely. She proposed that while on this trip, we should act separately and not as a couple. I asked her why, and she said that she hadn't actually forgiven me, and needed to take some time off for herself without me hanging over her shoulder but I rejected the idea because there is no way I'm leaving her alone in a country where something could easily go wrong. She was really mad that her proposal wasn't accepted, and kept ignoring me for the majority of our trip. My entire mood had been spoiled and I was considering ending it early and just going home. Little did I know, my wife was planning something sinister. After we went to the beach, we decided to spend some time at the bar. I thought that my mood would improve after having a few drinks and we could make up. But as soon as we sat down, she began talking to another guy. I literally saw her being extremely flirty with this guy, and responding to all his compliments even though I was sitting right next to her. I was about to say something when the other guy asked if she was with someone. To my absolute surprise, she replied, no, I'm here alone and would love to keep talking with you. Before he could say something in response, one of his friends called him. He said he'll be right back and left. I grabbed my wife's arm and asked what the f she thought she was doing. And this is what she said to me, oh, you didn't like that? Well, that is what happens when you don't listen to me. Consider it my revenge on you, Mr. Mama's boy. Now, do you think I should spend some more time with him, or are you ready to do as I say? I couldn't believe that she was actually thinking that cheating on me would make me listen to her. Over the last month, her arguments about me supporting my mother had really gotten on my nerves, and this was the last straw. So I ended up telling her, don't worry, you can do whatever you want. Because as of this moment, you and I are done. I am leaving you right here, and you can go sleep with that guy. As I tried to walk off, she hurriedly grabbed my arm and stopped me from leaving. She began saying that she was joking and that she loved him, and didn't want to leave me. She actually had the audacity to say that her flirting with another man in front of me was just a prank. But I was having none of it, and just booked a taxi to the hotel. She followed me and kept apologizing, but I contacted my lawyer right in front of her and told him to start preparing the divorce papers. The look on her face when she realized that she would no longer be able to enjoy the life I provided for her was immensely satisfying. 